My uh, last name, uh, surname in uh, Norwegian means brown or tan, so I'm always used to say that I'm tan all year. Ingrid Brun, Brun Hellora. It was real well, bright humor, I love it. And uh, what I want you guys to have after I have spoken today is that I want you guys to know and to feel uh, and understand what incredible resources the users are and what they want to be. I have heard some of you today and it seems like you have get, had a hard time to reach the users. But I promise you that they want to. I really mean that. But first I want to say a few words about mental health youth. I'm just using the short there. And our vision is that all children and adults have the best possible mental health. It's a pretty big vision, right? But we are going to somehow come close to it. And we do it in different ways. Uh, our organization is member-based, as it was said, but we also have a lot of projects. And most of our employees work on one or more projects. Uh, the recent projects we have are for farmers and Samis, mental health, youth-based. And we also do have a lot of projects when it comes to user interactions. The organization is also very much um, voluntarily based on a local basis. We have a lot, a lot of local chapters uh, and they also have meeting places where you can meet. I've been responsible for one since 2014 and it never, it always surprises me how much it can do just to have a place to meet. Uh, last uh, Thursday, we had my uh, place in Drammen in Buskeru was open and we were, had invited a local um, politician. He was in the same age group as us because we work until 31. So he was invited so he could have some user perspective. And he was a bit scared, I could see that when he came in. Uh, so we tried to invite him in the best way possible as we do with our members. We have a lot of waffles. We love waffles. Um, so, but I wasn't sure when I was leaving there if he liked it. But then he asked me before I went, can I come back? So that is really nice that we always get new people. But we also realized that our users and our members, they aren't often seen as resources in the community and the society. Often the opposite. They're seen as outcasts and in the, their life in general, they don't get many tasks or responsibilities. And those who don't give them that mean it all well, but it has its side effects. We realize that these members we have, they are incredible resources. They have so much to share and to give, but there's not many who give them that opportunity. That's why we created Mental Health Youth LTD, I don't know how it's assessed in English. Uh, that's the business. We have the organization and we also have a business. And I am the CEO of the business. And as you can see on top here, we have the general secretary of the organization. And on top there, we have the country manager of the organization. I mostly work for the business. But both the business and the organization do a lot when it comes to user participation. And that is a little bit of what I want to tell you about now. We think it's really, really important to use the users as the resources they are for so many reasons. And why we want to do that is because we see that you guys at the health system are trying, but it doesn't always succeed. Can we agree on that? Yeah? I have a, a cartoon or comic-ish that I like. Um, that it shows how it maybe feels for the user. Then you guys are the health system here on each side, and then we have Lasse, which is the user. And for those who don't understand what it said here, it says that, okay guys, now it's really important that we work together to pull Lasse. But I don't think Lasse is very comfortable with it. But you're trying very hard. And that is like the way I sometimes see it working. But it's not the way we want it to work. 
And why it maybe doesn't work, or if you don't know if it works or not, you can ask yourself a question. How many changes have you done last year of a result of user interaction the past year? And if the answer is close to zero, you maybe have your answer already. You don't have to say it out loud. But the thing is that many use, uh, health systems doesn't even know what user interaction is. You are obligated to have it, right? That you are, at least here in Norway. You're obligated to use it. But many, many doesn't know what it is. Uh, no matter who I'm speaking to, users or health systems, I in Norwegian used to uh, um, pull the word apart. Because user interaction in Norwegian is brukemedvikning. Very fancy word. And I used to say that you can pull that word apart in either three or two words. And that is brukke med virkning. And if you translate that directly, you get users with effects. And the last word there, effects, is the one many forgets. They can maybe invite users to come and participate and give their suggestions and ideas, but then it stops there. It doesn't have any effects. And even though, again, it's meant good, it gets the opposite effects. And I really like uh, a saying that I translated from Norwegian to English. I wish I was the author of it, but I'm not. No decision about me should be taken without me. Can you agree on that? Wouldn't you think the same? So we have thought a lot about it and we want to do more for the youth when it comes to user interaction. So I'm going to tell you about one project that isn't out in the market yet. We have, uh, are going to apply for financial support this week actually and hope to get it through. And also I'm going to talk about what one project we do have. So the first one is the one that is now yet, and we call it fortel.no, which can also be directly translated to tell.no. And what we want about that is it to be a digital platform where the users can come with their stories. We want it to be a digital history bank where you as a health system can get quality user advocacy and interaction and also courses, both for your users, but also for the health system and your colleagues. Its quality is a key word there. And for the users, we want it to be low threshold user interaction, just like the what you, a lot of what you've been talking about. That it's easy for someone to help and say their opinion from home. It's comfortable. It's more safe for them, and that's what we want to do. And we also wanted to be able to you guys to uh, ask us for assignments, submit assignments for specific cases that you want user interaction, and we will give it to you. And gather the information from the portfolio of users we have. And like I said, this one is not yet uh, in the market. We really hope it goes through and we get the financial support to do it. We think it has really a lot of potential. We also have tried to get user interaction while we wrote the project. So the health systems have given their word about it in a survey. Uh, Adibut was one. I don't know the direct translation, but it's uh, the Region Center for Youth Mental Health in the East and South. They have given their word. And also COAS, which is the municipality uh, sectors organization. That M word is really hard. <laughs> and they are really positive and want to help and want to contribute. So we really, really, like I said, hope this goes through. We also have asked for the users' uh, point of view and what they think and what needs for them to use it. Because this is a good project and a good idea, but it doesn't work unless the users use it. 
So we got a lot of good input, uh, inputs and that we put in the project, and in the end, the users asked, when is the page up and running? When can we use it? They were really, really positive about it. Because not many, want, many are scared to go out there and meet the professionals, you guys, but they still really want to help and contribute. So that is one of the projects we hope coming in the market soon. But we also have some projects already running. What we do is also we have courses for young adults. Because we saw that it was a lot of user interaction courses already, and a lot of our members have been to them. But it wasn't really customized for the youth. They didn't really get much out of it. So in 2015, we started a pilot project to create our own course for user interaction for our members. And ever since that, we around each year have had 50 participants all over the country to join the course. It is uh, several courses different side of the country supported by the Helse Sørøst, Nordvest and MIT uh, that we have. And the participants is really, really, really happy. We had it uh, for two weeks ago uh, in um, MIT and Nord actually, here in the north. And we're also going to have it in two weeks in uh, Sørøst. Southeast. And also, we're working on a user advocacy book that is going to be published in 2019, the last time I heard of it. And the course, like I said, is really good, but why is it? I want to take you on a little um, review of it. We have a lot of discussion, and I want you guys to join it. This is one of the discussions we have on the course. It goes over one weekend or one day, if it's uh, really intense. Those who work in the municipalities and in hostels are experts in their field. Users do not have the same expertise. What do you think about that? Do you agree? Someone is like, yeah, a little skeptic. What do you think the users are saying when I ask them that? Do they agree? Exactly, they do agree. Because we are well aware that you guys have a different expertise than what we have. We do know that, but we also want this kind of sentence to be expanded, because it is like you say, we don't have the same expertise as you, but we have our own expertise. But this is unfortunately, I have spoken to so many users since I joined the user, field, user interaction field, if you can call it that, in 2012. So I've spoken to so many and this is the overall uh, point of view from the users. They feel like, okay, we ha don't have the same, but our own expertise isn't recognized. They feel a lot like what I felt when I was sitting behind you guys and heard all about your expertise and such, and I was just a little me with no nothing. And that's a lot of what others are feeling as well. And like I said, we were well aware, you know, that we don't have the same expertise. And we haven't been sitting on the school bench for many years to get there. But like I used to say, we have what we call the use of confidence and expertise. And even though we haven't been on the school bench for it, often we have sacrificed the life of our health and almost life for it, for the expertise we have. And we got it more or less involuntarily. And we want to use it, and we want it to be seen in the same level as academic confidence. Because both of them are really good. I, like I said, I vouch for you. You guys are incredible with your academic competence. And we can be without it. But it works best hand in hand with the user expertise. Do you agree on that? Yeah? And it doesn't have to be the big kind of things, the user competence. I've been... Uh, 
For two years, I worked in a project in the Lierme facility, Kommune. <laughs> and uh, I remember one time they had made a pejor, pejor um, about the project, and they asked me to review it. And I didn't have much to say other than a few words that I didn't understand. But they still changed it. It still had an effect. They're like, okay, what can I, what would you use? What would you understand? So this is what we want. We want not to be over you, not to be under you, but beside you. Working together for the same goal. And that is also what I try to teach uh, the users as well. That we want to work beside you. They can sometimes be a little apprehensive because they had bad, bad experience in the health system. But I try to remind them that it's not it's the system you're working against, if you're working against anything, and not the people working in it. And they totally agree with me on that. We also have a different thing we discuss, because I've heard that a lot in the last couple of years, from the users themselves. I experienced the health system as bad. I do not see that it could get any better. Have you heard it? Yes, someone is like, doesn't want quite to admit it, but yeah. I think you have. I've heard it many times. And it's sad. But then I try to ask them, okay, if you have this attitude and come into the meeting with the health system, what do you expect? Then it, it doesn't can't get any better. Why are you there? So I really, for me, it's really important when we educate the users to tell, tell them that it's important to look for solutions, to be solution oriented. And the thing is that why they feel this, I completely understand it, because they have had bad experience. And when I ask them what was it that was bad, I get the same thing. And you heard it in the speech with Matthias here. He said one thing, it's all about being seen and heard, as human as it is. And you don't need an academic competence to be sure that someone is seen and heard. But still it's hard in the system. And that is why so, so many feel that the health system is bad. They aren't feeling seen and heard. And I had the same experience myself. Uh, when uh, I was at the doctor's uh, in January this year. I realized that I had a depression. I didn't want to admit it at first. But then I said, okay, I speak about openness and getting help, so I have to do it myself. So I went to the doctor and I said I had depression. And she said, well, it's many that has that now, after the vacation. And yeah, that's, that's true. I don't say that it's not true, but it doesn't help me very much, does it? No. So I said, okay, I agree with you on that, but it's actually pretty severe for me. At the worst, I have suicidal thoughts. I don't do anything with it, but it's pretty bad to have it either way. Can you guys guess what she said? A lot of people have that too. And that is unfortunately true as well, but again, it doesn't help me there and then. And I know that the way she talked and treated me was wrong, but I was on the verge of crying. And it was... And that is like a simple... She had... I researched and googled her afterwards, and she had 34 years experience in the field. But that didn't help me anyway, because I switched the doctor right away when I got home. So maybe if she had made me feel welcome and seen and heard right away, I would have used that expertise. Because I think she's good, but I didn't felt like I was met at the door with the welcome. And then I'm out. And it's really sad because I can handle it. I was pissed, but I could handle it because I knew it was wrong. But what about the adults, the young adults, that doesn't know it? And if you don't know it, it's a really big step to come to the doctor yourself and ask for help and then get met uh, in that way. 
So many feel that, but I still try to tell them, look for a solution. So this is what I tell them, that when I work as a user representative, for each problem, I try to have two solutions. And if I can't find that, I at least say that I will help you find it. And like I said, I also tell them that the system, not the staff that you're working against. Because I was that myself, I work both against the system and the staff. Uh, and I remember I was user representative in the LIE, and we talked about doctors. Uh, that we talked about, um, no, sorry, we talked about going from the child psychiatrist to the adult psychiatrist and the transition there. And there a lot of people have their own opinions, I have mine. And I was just like, someone needs to be at the child psychiatrist longer. And I was so waiting to get, defend myself and to tell my cause, but they just said, we totally agree with you. But we have laws and such. Then I realized that it's not the people, but the system we sometimes have to work against. So when I tell them how to find a solution or how to communicate the best, I tell them first tell about your challenges. What are your challenges? And how do you feel that the health, health system helped them? Did it help? How did you feel the communication went? And then the most important part, from problem to solution. How can you work it? And we also give them a case on this, because it's so important to work on a solution together with you guys. So we call it the case uh, cheese system, where they by themselves get to choose uh, a system they want in teams. And then they're working on this sheet, solution-oriented sheet, where the first pair is this is how it is. And then we have, this is how we want it to be. And the last one is, how can it become how we want it to be? It doesn't have to be any harder than that. And they get a lot of time to work in this and then represent it to the other ones. And we also try to tell them because they're really, they're really affected about it. So we try to tell that there's nothing right or wrong. If someone has had excellent experience with hospitals, someone has had bad, and everything is right. And why this is so important for me, uh, I see I'm soon at my end, but it's so important because we're working towards the same goal. Using both our expertise, we use, go towards the same goal, a better health system, right? Yes. But it can also have an individual effect which we also try to focus on on the courses. We call it empowerment, which is really, really important. <laughs> yeah, but it is. It, all, it is so important, because if it, uh, user interaction is used right, it can really empower an individual. And uh, I'm gonna show you some examples and tell about some examples, but uh, one way you can empower someone in the health system is by what this. Have you seen it before? Yeah, yeah. someone has. Has someone not from Norway seen it before? <laughs> no? Okay, I will tell you about it. No worries. We call it the head sheet. The uh, head stands for Varikti uh, Frei which in English can be translated to what is important to you. And it is a sheet where the um, point of the sheet is to provide services to the patient that the patient wants, the patient feels he wants. And to make sure that the patient is the expert in its own life. And it's been really recognized here in Norway. You can see it here again. Here you they by themselves choose what they want to focus on, and by each conversation, how it went. So I am at the end, I am really, so I just want to say, the last thing I want to say is to do this, to use interact, user interaction the best. Communication is important, both with you, together, but also the users. I have a really short, funny story. When I was sent to the child psychiatrist, 
They didn't want to diagnose me because I was soon 18 and going to the adult section. But they said that we think you have ADD and Taurus. I didn't know what it was. I had a little idea what ADD was, but not Taurus. I was really not. Uh, I was really shy when they said it, so I didn't dare to ask what it was. So I made my own opinion about it. I thought that it was Downs. I went a week thinking I had Down syndrome. Yeah. So that's a little story I used to tell to tell you guys the importance of communication. I hope someone more will laugh, but that's okay. <laughs> I can laugh myself. Uh, my end word is, even though we may not always feel like it, the users they really want to help, participate, and contribute. You just have to give them the chance. And like I said, empowerment is really important. And why it is, is because you heard my story from 2012. Today, thanks to both the organization and user interaction, I am a public speaker about mental health. And that wouldn't be without that, those two. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for an inspiring, interesting presentation. Any comments from uh, from you? Any questions? So let me ask you, what do you think are the, the main obstacles to the involvement of users? Is this, is this culture or, or power between lay people and expertise? They are like a, a block, they are working together using noise concepts and... That's a really good question. I think it has a lot to do with expectations. But not always do you guys know what you want. And that's maybe the first question you have to ask. What do you want from the user? And also communication along the way. And treat them as an equal. With a different expertise, but still their own expertise. There may be also uh, interactions, because we've been talking about interaction and these guys and, and girls, they've been interacting since, since school days. <laughs> <laughs> when you are trying to make uh, uh, arenas for, for interaction between users. Yes. Thank you very much. To introduce uh, the next speaker, she used to be my colleague. Now she's my boss. <laughs> and uh, let me see. what's your name? <laughs> I like to introduce Ed Rilsett. I was looking actually about the, the, the title of the of the presentation. She's, she's a section manager from um, the Health Service Develop Development Department at uh, the University Hospital. And um, she's going to talk about video contact solution for child welfare institutions. I'm going to tell you about now. 
My name is Elin Rodzat and I work as a section head uh, at the e-health department at the University Hospital of Northern Norway. Um, earlier I worked uh, in the ECAP project um, and in many ways uh, we stand on the shoulders of the ECAP project in this project. So we can thank ECAP for what I'm going to tell you now. Um, first of all, I would like to start thanking our partners, our international partners from Scotland, Finland and Sweden. It has been very nice collaborating with you. And I also would like to thank Erin for being the boss of ECAP. <laughs> um, the project which I will present for you now, uh, I worked uh, closely together with Alan, who spoke earlier, so he's part of this as well. Um, I will tell you about a survey and a pilot, and also something which hopefully will be a standardized national service. And then I forgot. Now I remember that I forgot to also thank someone else. I forgot to thank uh, our partners in the Norwegian Directorate of Health and the Norwegian Directorate of Children, Youth and Family Affairs. They are actually here today. So it's uh, because of them uh, I can tell you about this. Um, the main group of uh, the service which I'm going to tell you about uh, is children taken care of by the Child Welfare Services or Narana in Norwegian and more specifically it's about children living in residential child care institutions in Norwegian that is Barnevange Institutioner um, this is one of uh, I would say the most vulnerable groups we have so we really have to look after them I'm going to start and say a few words about uh, background. Uh, why do we want to use video solutions in residential care institutions? And how did we get involved? Um, we did a survey. I will say a few words about the survey. And then a pilot is coming up. So, what is the background? Well, the um, the Norwegian Director of Health and the Norwegian Directorate for Children, Youth and Families Affairs um, asked us how can technology be used to provide mental health care for children and youth in residential care institutions? It was kind of a very broad <laughs> task because technology is so much. So we had to uh, with our background, we had to help them and <laughs> um, define what is uh, technology. And uh, together we agreed that yes, technology can in this uh, now we can talk about video technology and not technology as such. Um, and the the reason um, the reason for that the, um, for this assignment um, was uh, a research project uh, from 2015 documenting that the mental health among children and youth in residential child care institutions is very poor. Uh, it's a, a report, Sikis Council Span Only Online Institution um, this report is, comes from um, uh, the Norwegian, uh, what do you call it? You know? NTNU. It's the university in Trondheim. And um, we also have the, um, the report in English. And they did a nationwide study. Um, and what they saw, well, they interviewed actually children all over the country in, in uh, institutions. And they saw that there, first of all, there was a kind of what they call a lacuna of research on, on diagnosis among the children living in institutions. Um, so, we wanted to, to identify 
the prevalence and comorbidity of mental disorders. Um, they had actually they sent uh, the interviews to 600 adolescents in institutions. And I'm going to what they saw is that summing up, they, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, information in this report. But what they saw, found out that is that three out of four children in child welfare institutions have one or more uh, mental disorder. That's a quite a lot. Uh, and in addition to this, um, um, only 38% uh, of them have actually received help from mental health services the last three months. It's a quite um, depressing background here. Then the records came to, to us because at that time we were part of the, or had been part of the telemedicine center in Tromsø. So they asked us, uh, well, how can we uh, buy equipment <laughs> to the institutions? We want to start up. And we said, ay, 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 stop, stop, stop. <laughs> it's not that easy. It's not only about equipment. Yes, we have to buy uh, video equipment, but um, this is much more. Uh, and then my favorite sentence is, the technology is about 20% and then the rest, organization, people, routines is 80%. So um, we started discussing with the uh, directorates and uh, since we had experience from the ECAP project and also from the mastermind project, um, we uh, realized that maybe we could start collaborating. Um, and at the same time, uh, what Alan told us earlier today, we've had a kind of a paradigm shift in the north because uh, the, the Northern Norway Regional Health Trust had distributed Sky for Business solutions for all employees, all staff in Northern Norway, at all hospitals. So we had some experience which the rest of the country didn't have. Uh, we had um, um, we had gone through all these uh, routine descriptions, and uh, we were allowed to actually use Sky for Business clinically. Uh, at that time, the rest of the country had not the same experience, and they had not started using uh, Sky for Business as a clinical tool. They were not allowed to do it. So um, we, um, we agreed that we could start uh, a survey and um, we did that in 2017. We started up in June uh, and uh, the report was finalized uh, in January this year. So what we did, um, we spent half a year and we sent uh, questionnaires two institutions uh, all over the country and we also sent uh, questionnaires to um, the specialist healthcare in Norway and asked them what kind of uh, video equipment do you have, do you use the video equipment, how much, how often do you use it, do you use it clinically um, and uh, would you like to use it clinically if you don't use it clinically today? Such questions. Yeah. And we also spent some time traveling around and we did interviews with uh, children living in one institution. Um, unfortunately, we didn't speak to many, so we only have a, not much data from that. But we spoke to some youth and we also spoke to uh, staff at the institutions about this service. Um, I'm going to say a, a little bit later about the attitude towards video consultations among all these groups. Um, we also did um, a risk analysis, uh, especially the, well, both of the uh, uh, directorates were skeptical and they had a lot of people behind them who were extremely skeptical about doing this. 
So we, we did a lot of work on that, on the risk analysis and also uh, on the law and regulation behind this. But we concluded that yes, this is safe enough, the law can support such a uh, thing to do such a thing. And we did a, um, a, a start of a gain analysis, which will be followed up. And we also um, <coughs> made the framework of a training model. The idea is that we would like to have an online health um, competence. Uh, so we have some colleagues here who are going to develop it for us, but uh, online training, we can conclude. Uh, and we spent some time on um, drawing up the organizational model and also how to implement this, um, this project. So, what we saw. Uh, the, the staff in the child welfare institutions, quite many of them had uh, used uh, video technology. But of course we could see that those who had already used it they were more positive towards giving treatment on video. Those who had not experienced were really skeptical. Maybe not um, rocket science, but yes, this is what we saw. Uh, they said that maybe uh, using video uh, technology can uh, give a more available and flexible treatment. We have heard earlier from ECAP project, the experience that yes, actually it is so. Uh, and it would, of course, be suitable for long distances, they said. Maybe uh, many of these uh, youngsters, they uh, travel around the country, actually. First they live at home, then they live in one institution, and then they're sent to another institution, to a third institution. And maybe at the first place, they got contact to a psychologist, and then they will lose the contact when they travel around. So hopefully this project this service can make them uh, continue, have a continuation with the original uh, psychologist. Um, and, but some of those we spoke to said, uh, is, is, do you get a, a close enough personal contact with the psychologist online? Then we spoke to the youth. And they were really skeptical, worried. Uh, <laughs> they did not think this is a good idea at all. Um, they uh, asked questions like, is this safe enough? Will I lose control of the information? No, I would never do it. Maybe I could speak to the school nurse, but maybe if I had a small eye problem, not with severe problems, no, not at all. But then again, some of them said that maybe it could be a good alternative for those who are not unable, who are unable to go to the psychologist if they're too tired. Or... So um, this is something we really have to take to consider when we de develop this service. <coughs> we have to work closely with the users. On the other hand, the, the user organizations, they were very positive. We spoke to two organizations, uh, for the and for the Barnevans Bank. It's an organization for child, yeah, <laughs> and also for uh, Andringsfabrikken. So two two organizations, and and they said yes, we have wait, wait, waited for this. We have asked for it for a long time. Now finally it's here. Uh, the specialists. The psychologists at the speci uh, specialist psychiatric care, um, they were actually quite positive. I, I haven't filled in the numbers, but we asked them I, the quest, on the question, I am positive to giving treatment from child care institutions on video, 57%, uh, that's the red and the blue, all together agree, uh, agree or highly agree that this is, uh, this is a good uh, solution for them. And only five disagree highly. So I think this is, uh, uh, and we could see when we saw, when we looked deeper into the data, we saw that those who were really uh, negative to this, they had um, specialist competence, which is not maybe suitable giving a video conference anyway. So now 
we have uh, agreed uh, with our two partners in the directorate to uh, to continue. Uh, we we uh, gave them the advice to to uh, to start off with a pilot, and uh, we are now actually in this very moment <laughs> planning the pilot. Um, and what we uh, what we, um, we we want to use video in three ways. We think that it's a good idea to give treatment on video. We think it is a good idea to use video as we do in Finland for cooperation and coordinated care, and also on training and supervision. Um, this is from ETAP again, standing on the shoulders of the, this is the <laughs> film uh, Alan showed us. So uh, on video consultations, we think that the patients can sit in their own room in the institution or another suitable room in the <coughs> institution. Um, on the same, same thing as uh, for ECAP, we, they can use their own private computer or uh, a computer uh, owned by the institution. When it comes to coordinated care and training and supervision, uh, there are, for example, four partners which could be included. Probably there are more, but at the moment, of parents is one part which is not included here, but specialist healthcare, child care institutions, the youth organization, and of course general practitioners. And the patient in the middle. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we are going to start up now. Um, as, as I said, we are planning the pilot at the very moment. Uh, my colleague Rita Christine, which is here today, is, <laughs> she's the head of the planner. Uh, and we are going to start up uh, in two hospitals in Norway. Um, hopefully, one of these hospitals will be UN, our hospital. Uh, and probably we will, uh, the other hospital will be either in the western part of Norway and or the southern part of Norway. We haven't, we haven't decided yet. And that will connect up with uh, probably two or three institutions in e each region. That depends on how many children there are in the institution. Some of these are quite small. Uh, so, yeah, we have to be flexible on this. So, the, po the point with the pilot is we're going to make this, uh, test out this model. Uh, and we'll start with doing uh, needs assessments. And we want to include all parties. We'll include the, the youth, the youngsters, and the staff in the institution, and of course the staff at the specialist healthcare. Uh, we have to spend quite a lot of time on training. We know that from ECAP. It takes a lot of time. Training and description of routines and uh, cooperation agreements. And also, again, risk analysis. We have to take it seriously. Um, and as I told you earlier, the, the youth are quite skeptical about this. So we have to spend quite a lot of time on working together and reassure them that this is a good solution. How can it be safe enough for you? So information, of course, and grounding and everything is important. And then uh, we'll uh, do a small evaluation. It's not research, but we'll um, send out questionnaires uh, throughout the, when we start up using the system. So, uh, we, we know, we know, <laughs> we, we know that uh, there are few video services within child and adults and psychiatric care today. Uh, Trumsa, uh, what we have done in Trumsa is, uh, well, we have got quite a lot of uh, telephones the last few years from other parts of the country who want to learn from us. So. Uh, what we have done here is special. Uh, we are very proud of the, the stuff uh, sitting in the middle here. You are actually doing it. Um, and there are few, very few
few national initiatives on video services as such, not only on psychiatric care, but on, on video services as such. Uh, and there are definitely no video services for children in residential care institutions. So the research, the results from this pilot will be of national value. Yeah, very much so. Um, this will make a knowledge base for national decision makers, I think. Um, and it will also give us knowledge on video consultations on a general basis. And also on video consultations to a particularly vulnerable group. So, hopefully, within, uh, within a, a, not a year, a year and a half, we will know that we will know if this is a suitable way of working to provide good health care to children in child welfare institutions. We will probably know, uh, or hopefully we will know whether children do get better, uh, better health care by using this technology. <coughs> and also of importance, will the interaction between child welfare and specialist health care services improve? Um, we are starting now, we started in August, but now really it's a um, kickoff. Uh, we're planning uh, the, the pilot uh, this autumn, and then uh, we will carefully start up after Christmas. Um, yeah, we, we haven't set the, uh, the date yet, but um, spring, autumn uh, 2019, they will conduct the, the pilot. And then also the evaluation will go up uh, at the same time. And by spring 2020, we will uh, uh, have finalized the report. So if we're by 2021, uh, we will hopefully have a standardized national service. <coughs> and it is, it is about users and um, as you told us this is like a new services I'm just wondering about uh, does this, this mean additional an additional services also including more work for the specialist uh, healthcare system or thinking about using the services in the more coordinated uh, and better way? Probably in the beginning it will be more work for the specialist healthcare because they uh, will be included in uh, <laughs> developing the routines and training and all these things. That's the drawback of the story, of course. Uh, it's a everyone knows that uh, when we have to change the working method, it's hard. But uh, hopefully, um, we will see that uh, this is uh, this will aim the patients, and maybe it will reduce the the level of uh, inagresa acute uh, ad admissions to the hospital. Uh, when we did the research, when we uh, went and interviewed. Uh, the, the, the child welfare institutions, we heard quite horrible stories about children being admitted to hospital and some of them had to travel several hours and then they came to the hospital and they had to go back again. Uh, so if we could have a, a video service, uh, um, 
and avoiding these admittance it would be very helpful for the patient and for the staff at the institutions. And again, for the staff at the hospital. Hmm. Thank you. I think that thank you very much for your interesting presentation, and I think that you partly answered already. But I had uh, to ask from you. But but you concluded that uh, uh, this will be a kind of national service. So now you, uh, as far as I understood, now you are piloting it in two unit, in two hospitals. So what are your thoughts about uh, disseminating it in other areas and what kind of uh, silences, for instance, may emerge? It, it depends on the experiences we do during the pilot. But if we see that this is a, a method which works, uh, hopefully the, the government sees that this is a model to be distributed all over the country. And, and they say today that they, they, they want this, mm -hmm. um, and that but that again will be um, it, it will take some time mm -hmm. because it will include all hospitals all over Norway and, <laughs> and all institutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Elian, for this uh, interesting presentation and for inviting me to join this very interesting project. Looking forward to working with you and Rita. Thank you. It's a break.